morning. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, uh, first in a series of lectures by Professor Leon Chua from Memristors and Cellular Nonlinear Networks to the Edge of Chaos. Uh, I have a, a, a deep admiration for Leon. I have been following his work for a very long time. Uh, I'm, I am privileged to hold uh, his, his uh, book, uh, Introduction to Nonlinear Network Theory, in my hands. Uh, last year, if you went online and attempted to buy such a book, it would cost about $800. Uh, since then, a few of them have come online, so the price has come down a little bit. It's, it's the law of supply and demand. But uh, if you can get a hold of it, and if you're at all interested in the topic, it's, it's, it's hefty. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely the, the book that you have to have. So let me just uh, uh, get uh, rolling here quickly. Professor Leon Chua is known internationally as the pioneer of three major research areas, namely nonlinear circuits, cellular neural networks, and complexity and chaos, all of which he will be describing as part of this lecture series. His work in these areas has been recognized internationally through numerous major awards, and if I attempted to name them all, I would use up the entire hour. But they do include 12 honorary doctorates from major universities in Europe and Japan. He was also elected a fellow of IEEE in 1974 and a foreign member of the European, uh, European Academy of Sciences, the Academia Europe, Europea, in 1997. He has been honored with many IEEE prizes, and I can see right now that if I men mentioned them all, I would take up too much time. So let's just say that, that uh, uh, I have a half a page full of nothing but IEEE pages alone here, but uh, including uh, the inaugural uh, uh, Gustav Kirchhoff Award in 2005, uh, largely because this book was the uh, extension of Kirchhoff's laws to nonlinear uh, systems. Uh, Professor Chua has, offered, not, has authored nine books and more than 520 papers in refereed journals, and collectively they have been cited well over 20,000 times in the peer reviewed literature. He is recognized as the father of nonlinear circuit theory, uh, as uh, the father of the cellular neural networks, and not inconsiderably, the father of the tiger mother. <laughs> uh, uh, however, it's in the long term, uh, Leon may become best known as the electrical engineer and scientist who predicted the properties of the memristor, the fourth passive electronic circuit element from pure mathematical theory and symmetry. Please join me in welcoming Leon Chua. Thank you. Good morning for you uh, folks here, and good evening for the folks tuning in from Germany and Europe, and good morning to those from Tokyo and Korea, which is 2 a.m. in the morning or 2.30 in the morning. Uh, I'm going to give you today a glimpse of uh, the next 11 lectures so that you get a little flavor of what this talk's all about. And it's going to cover three topics, as you will see, and they're all actually uh, related in some way, but they're all common in the sense that they are highly nonlinear and then have very, very strange, strong dynamics. That's the common denominator. Uh, so today, let me gonna go over the first part. There will be three parts, and each part, I'll perhaps spend a little bit more on part one, and then less on the second, third part, because part one is one that is of most current interest, is on the membristors. And I'm gonna start by telling you that uh, in 1960, there was a crisis in electronic circuit theory, which most of you probably didn't know, but, uh, the, the previous 10 years has been what I call the Cambrian era for electronic uh, circuit people, because uh, the Cambrian era, is, as you, many of you know, occurred 540 million years ago when all of a sudden, uh, all kinds of animal species emerged. Prior to that, there were only one cell mechanism, and there was a proliferation over a very short period of time and that is the counterpart in 1950, when all of a sudden we have all kinds of solid state devices emerging. And that caused a crisis 
which I will show you. Uh, I'll show you one of the devices. Uh, it's called the Esaki diet, or otherwise today called Tanner diet. And whose inventor, Leo Esaki, um, received a Nobel Prize for this invention. And the unique things about this device is that it has a, a v voltage versus current curve uh, on the left, uh, bottom left. And uh, it has a peak and a valley, a bit like the Santa Cruz Mountain and the Silicon Valley, and the way it emerges again towards San Francisco. It's that kind of a strange nonlinearity that nobody expected before. And the reason this created a crisis is because if I uh, look at the simplest possible circuit, just put an inductor across it, and ask the question, uh, what would happen if I put in a small initial current and close the switch, uh, what would be the steady state behavior? How do you write the state equations uh, of this simple, the simplest of all circuit? And I will tell you that no one from MIT in 1960 knows how to write the state equation of the circuit. And they still don't today, nor from people from Stanford. <laughs> and you will know why, because, and, and you will be ashamed to ask because it is so simple. You will know the answer next week, next year too. You will know everything you wish to know about memory stores, but afraid to ask things that you thought are too simple to ask, and they are not. Okay, and, and you will find the answer to what I said today, why no MIT people or, or Stanford people would, today knows how to answer that question. They don't know how to write the state equation, let alone finding the solutions. Okay, the second device out of the Pretoria, many other devices that were that flourished in the 50s is a device called the Varactor diode, which stands for variable capacitor. And it was very important then because it was the device where you can use to make very low noise amplifier, in particular parametric amplifiers. And when you pump that amplifier, this device behaves like a time varying capacitor. All of a sudden, the capacitor changes with time. And people who didn't understand then, and many still today, is they start to put in. Uh, I'd say I put in a sine wave across that device and find out what's the current, they would invariably substitute into the first equation. By the way, which I list out the three basic equations for the three classic circuit elements and the date where it, they were first discovered and, or made. And these three equations remain the equation that we teach all our students today, starting from senior high school days. And unfortunately, you will see that uh, if you uh, plug in this time varying capacity into the first equation, you will actually get the wrong answer. That was the second crisis. That these equations do not work anymore when the device is nonlinear non or time varying. This is why when I went to MIT as a graduate student in 1960, that was where the crisis started and no one really knows what to do. And I decided I'm, that's going to be my research area. And that continued to be today. And this lecture is reflect the highlights of some of these results. Among other things, beginning on next week, I will be creating the foundation for this uh, area. It's called nonlinear circuit theory. And um, one of those consequences is that a fourth element has to be created just to make the theory complete. That element is called the memory store. And uh, it was published in 1971. And it was duly forgotten because they were, for many years, because there was never had a, there was, had not been a device that was built that is a solid state memory store. And it languished for about 37 years until 2008 when Dr. Stanley Williams, who just introduced myself a few minutes ago, uh, with his wonderful laboratory, created the world's first memory store. And uh, by the way, before I tell you what a memory store is, which I will actually define next week, I will give you a very simple definition today. And in fact, it is probably the best definition for the rest of this course. 
I still re recall the first, top, first uh, picture I showed the Isaki diode. It has a VI curve that has a hump and a valley, but that is called a constitutive relation because no matter what signal you apply, a sine wave, triangular wave, or whatever signal, the current you measure will always follow that curve. A memristor is different. When you apply the same signal, say a sine wave, you are not going to get a single curve. You are going to get a hysteresis curve. And the hysteresis curve is peculiar. It's, not, it's unlike those that most of you are familiar with. It is pinch at the origin. And it turns out that this is the best definition for, for the Fox here. And it, in fact, is the best definition experimentally. So I define at the main register by the, just three words, four words. If it's pinch, it's a main register. Any curve, any device that you put in a sine wave or any periodic signal, you find a VI curve that is not a single value curve, but something that goes through the origin. I guarantee you that is a main register. Okay, so uh, the HP main register is shown on the left hand side. And it did have a pinch hysteresis loop on the right hand side. So just by virtue of my definition today, it is a membristor. And it is in fact a very simple device. It's got titanium dioxide sandwiched between two, uh, uh, two platinum electrodes. Nothing could be simpler than that. By that way, uh, for those of you who didn't know titanium dioxide looked like, I have a little sample here that I always like to carry in my talks. And I want to tell you a true story about uh, in 2010 when I was asked to give the opening talk at the uh, annual conference on neural network in Washington, DC. And I, I almost missed the flight from San Francisco because the security found that little tube and retained me and thought that I was carrying cocaine <laughs> with me. Okay. Now, the HP memory store, as of 2008, looks like that. And it, or those white dots, is a memory store, and you will see that it's already uh, about 17 nanometers. So it's not only that it fits the role, the definition of memory, but it is so small. So small, it's smaller than the little round picture there is the smallest known virus, which is 25 nanometer. And so, and each one of these is a non-volatile memory, which means that uh, you can pull the plug and don't put in any power, and that memory cell will exhibit a high or low resistance. And that becomes the memory. That's why it's called non-volatile memory. This is an area that is now already a $120 billion industry, and it will continue to be so. So you can see why there was so much industrial interest. Let me move on uh, uh, to the next slide. You, you want to know where can I buy a memory store? Tell us there is a, uh, there are two startups today that you can buy one. And I have just, uh, I was given a sample here. So you can buy a real memory store today if you wish. Okay, now you can put all those memory stores not only in a the, in, in the single layer, but you can pack them up according to SP's uh, publication about two or three years ago. And this order was not built yet, but it is uh, conceivable in the near future that you can stack them together. And if you have, say, a stack of six or seven of them, you can actually pack the entire US Library of Congress. 21 million books, about 10 terabytes, all in one little tiny cube. That was quite amazing. And, but Memristor has many other applications. For example, it takes only two memory stores to make all the Boolean functions that you need in electronics or in computers. Here's an example of what you have in your PC or in your iPhone, uh, a serial full adder, which is what you need to add two numbers. Uh, today would typically require 50 five zero transistors. You can do exactly the same thing with only 10 memristors, for example. 
So you, you reduce the size and do exactly the same thing and also faster. And this is quite a improvement. Another example, most pe people who knew anything about an you know, oscillator that you need in your iPhone or everywhere else would need at least two energy storage elements, two capacitors, two inductors, or, or an inductor and a capacitor in, to make an oscillator. Everybody knows it's all in all textbooks. But if you are allowed to use memory store, we've just shown that with a single memory store and a battery, you are going to get an oscillation. If you operate that memory store, or not all, but certain memory store, and operate on the edge of chaos, which is the third topic of this lecture series. And in other words, memory store, in fact, can extend more slow in some way, because since memory store has both nonlinearity and dynamics, and can be scaled down to some nanometer size, it can increase functionality while reducing the number of devices in hybrid integrated circuit without shrinking transistors. But memory store not only can process signals, it can actually be an actuator. What you're seeing on the left here is a medieval cutter port, and you put in a, 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 a piece of uh, stone in there, and we'll cut upon it when, once it's uh, unlocked. But that stone cannot be any heavier than the catapult itself, and it can be heard too far away. A paper has just been pub published last year by Professor Wu toward the end with a, uh, from the UC Berkeley and with his wonderful group. Uh, they just published a paper last year, and they put in my name where I have also actually have no contribution other than to tell them that what they had is, in fact, a memory store. This paper has been recognized instantly that Professor Wu was recognized as one of the winners of the Presidential Early Career Award in this award ceremony just last year. So what this is is that it consists of micron size. This is 50 micron size, and it can be smaller if you wish. But the one that is demonstrated it has two coil and a little latch in the center. You can see that you can put in a tiny object. This device is a memory store, which I had confirmed because I asked them to trace the VI curve, and you see it's a hysteresis. It's a pinch hysteresis loop. And one of the fingerprints is that as you increase the frequency of tracing, the loop area shrinks. It has all the fingerprints of a memory store, so it's a memory store. Here is the real demonstration. I actually have a movie of that, so it's real. You put in, say, a one volt battery across that um, 50 micron device, and you put in a, a tiny object like there, and this is a, a snapshot. This is actually in motion. So that, that thing is just being kicked out. Now, this is amazing because this device is not just processing signal. It is a catapult. I call it a micro catapult. It's a thousand times more powerful than the human muscle. It can catapult objects 50 times heavier than itself. It can catapult objects over a distance five times its length. None of this you can do with conventional catapult. And it's faster than the blink of an eye. And just to show you how powerful it is, look at this turbofan engine down in the right corner of a 777. It has a power density of 9 kilowatt per kilogram, rotation speed of 10,000 RPM. Now imagine you scale up the catapult memory store made of vanadium dioxide. Imagine you can scale up to the size of a 777. And you ask for the performance. It has a power density of 39 kilowatts per kilogram, more than four times than the 77 turbofan. And it has 200,000 RPM, 20 times faster. That's what this memory store is capable of. OK, now there are many other things that I'm skipped because uh, we're going to do that next time. But let me go to the real reason why I'm giving this talk today. And that's because memory store is more than just memory. It's more than just catapult. It has intelligence. And this is an example 
of a sea snail. It, the official name is Aplysia. And you can see the sea snail is wearing a Nobel Medal. This is the picture that Eric Kandel flushed to the floor in front when he gave when his Nobel Prize uh, lecture in Stockholm in two, year 2000. And it was, this, it was taken from this book, this picture. And from that experiment, that many experiments he conducted with this little animal, I mean, this, this little uh, species called Aplysia sea snail, you notice that the, the, the anatomy, that it has a little tube-like structure, uh, it's called a siphon, which is essential for its uh, well-being because it's needed that for breathing. If you touch it by just gently touch it, it will immediately contract because it senses danger. And of course, after a while, it had to stick out again to breathe. So Eric Kandel conducted an experiment, and he put in the little paintbrush, and he would measure the action potential that is sensed when that happened, and, and the motor, the, the, the signal from the uh, down inside to attach to the muscle that initiate the contraction of the muscle. And this is, he, he made 15 such experiments. And, and of course, he waited for five minutes for the aplysia to stick out the tube again, and he would touch again. So as expected, the sensor, every time you get action potential, 15 of them, as you see in the top row, they're all the same, same height. But what Kandel observed was that the appreciator has learned that it, is, that it was not so dangerous as first thought. So in the first, he showed, she showed only five of the 15. Down below is the response. You can see that every, uh, the, the first response is big, big contraction. Then uh, the second, the fifth, and 10, and the 15 get less and less. The appreciator has learned. It's, it's, it's a kind of intelligence. Now, next lecture, I will show you that with one memory serve, it will do exactly the same thing. Down below are 15 pulses to emulate the 15 identical action potentials that Kandel observed. And up in the middle are the corresponding response and the five of the corresponding numbers uh, indicated, you can see that they're exactly the same performance. And since the membrane works exactly like the real neuron, in fact, it works with a synapses, yep, one can say that, in fact, synapses are membrane This is a typical neuron that you and I and most animals possess today. The, the, Contact that, that those uh, dendrites made with the neighbors are the, mem are the membristors. They are the synapses. And down in the bottom is a single line that's called an axon, and that's where the output signal which spits out the action potential. Now, let's move forward. This phenomenon of general action potential was known since the early turn of the century, 19th century, but no one was able to come up with a simple model or equation so that it will show that there is an action potential when the stimulus is applied. It took 50 years until 1952 when Hoskin and Huxley came up with this beautiful model on, shown in the middle, made of three capacitors I mean, one capacitor, three batteries, and three resistors, except that the second and the third one are called the potassium and sodium resistors or conductors. But they are not ordinary conductors in the sense that they, they, Husky and Huxley was not, well, not able to specify what is the value. They had to solve the differential equation, and that equation produced the resistances or conductances over time. Although that is a strange kind of uh, way of specifying conductances, nevertheless, the equations allow Husky and Huxley to produce the action potential. That was enough to deserve a Nobel Prize 
And this model remains widely used today. There has not been any better model. Okay, now, if you now string this chain of this model and the bottom, I call down the Husky and Huxley cell, and with it interspersed by linear resistor, you would model the action. And you will see that action potential will propagate from left to right when you stimulate from the left. This is how action actually got their Nobel Prize for this uh, model that would do exactly or almost exactly what the real action would do. However, Haskin and Cole, a contemporary of his, a, 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 another famous scientist that many believe should have shared their Nobel Prize because he, uh, Haskin and would not be able to make this experiment without his help. Anyway, Haskin and Cole have, and many other scientists of his days have independently measured from the squid axon membrane gigantic inductances. When I say gigantic, something like 0.2 Henry to 1 Henry, for example. And they were able to measure also a DC, DC V, I could look like a PN junction diode. And yet, this, is, this took essential components uh, that they measure are uh, not in the model at all. That was why it's called anomalous. In fact, Cole was so frustrated, he, in his book he said, the suggestion of an inductive reactance anywhere in the system was shocking to the point of being unbelievable. And I'm carrying an inductor, that's one Henry. That's, you can see why it's unbelievable. If our brain would have such an inductor, uh, we would not be here today, okay? And so, so the, here's a cartoon which says that where are the, if you have inductors with such big inductance, you have gonna have gigantic magnetic fields, and you're gonna have diodes all over, where are they in the brain? And of course we all know that they don't, they don't exist. The answer for that, we now know today, is simply that those two time-varying conductances are in fact not time-varying conductances. They are memristors. So memristors, in fact, and not only the building blocks of the brain, in a, in a sense that synapses are memory stores, we can now say the actions are also made of memory stores, and therefore brains, our brains, and all brains are made of memory stores. It is therefore, they are the right stuff for making brain-like computers. So now let me move on to cellular and nonlinear network, which from now on I'll abbreviate by CNN. And I will tell you a true story uh, that was invented, I, I published a paper in 1988, and just at, at, uh, shortly after the Iraq war, nobody heard of CNN until the Iraq war. And then suddenly we know of CNN. And shortly after that, I got a, a threatening letter from the vice president of CNN. Threatening mean not to use CNN because that's their property. Fortunately, I haven't got a, 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 a lawsuit yet, uh, so it's, it's okay. So CNN actually predates uh, the CNN station as you would know it. And uh, what you see here is a real CNN that Toshiba just put in the market. They called it, they don't want to call it CNN, they call it smart photo sensor, but it's very small. You can see the, 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 uh, it's almost as white as a one euro coin on the left. It's, it's in the market today, and it is built exactly based on my design, a CNN, and it was built from uh, a, a, a circuit manufacturer, uh, first designed in Spain, and uh, which they bought, which Toshiba bought. And, but that circuit is exactly a CNN. And it is basically a brain-like image processing chip which computes elementary image processing and recognition tasks in nanoseconds via nonlinear dynamic, a totally different way of processing signals. Imagine the, now the, the lens is looking at this pretty lady, and the CNN, at least the, in this chip, in this uh, photo sensor, it's just a grid. Well, every point at the grid is a cell 
made of CMOS circuits. The important thing is that all the cells are identical. So what's a CNN? A CNN, in the broadest definition, is just a collection of identical cells. So all the cells are identical. And they interact by identical influences and typically within a certain number of neighbors that I call the sphere of influence. So each cell is connected only to a few. This is how you can build this circuit. Unlike uh, the Huffield net that some of you may have of, where every cell has to be connected to every other cell, which is why you will never see a practical Huffield net. The CNN is a miniaturized Huffield net in some sense, where the influence is only the, uh, the, the, the neighbor or the next nearest neighbors. This is the picture of a uh, two-dimensional CNN. And the chip, actually, that you have seen, has if you look at just because they, all, the, all the cells are identical. Just look at one as at location IJ. And they are, each cell, remember, is identical to every other cell. And they are only connected through simple circuitry to its immediate neighbor, the eight of them. And so this mimic essentially a neuron where you have only eight neighbors. And you have an action uh, that could contact with the neighbors, and it could come back to itself. And uh, this is the equation that we don't need to go into detail today, except that equation, uh, because every cell is identical, so we need to look at only one cell. And it's a differential equation. And uh, the equation has, however, nine parameters that on the left is one number is called a threshold. And then the, you have an A template with nine numbers. It's called an A template. And the, another nine numbers called the B template. They're called templates because once you build one circuit, all the others are identical. You just, just copy them. But the remarkable thing about this invention is that it has only 19 numbers. 19 numbers determine what this cell is going to do and how it's intelligent. Only 19 number in the sense that the instruction for executing an elementary image processing task is specified by only 19 real numbers and cloning templates, all from now on. Let's call that a gene because it's just like a gene. You just need some information. We need 19 pieces of information. So from now on, instead of telling me these are the nine, uh, the three templates or nine, I'm just going to string them all, starting from the left. Uh, for this case say 0.5, 1, minus 1, minus 1, et cetera, until the last one. For this particular 19 number, this CN will do one and only one thing, but it will do it exactly right for any input pattern. Uh, and for example, in fact, I'm going to give you another one, which is minus 8.5. It's a different template. It will do another thing. For example, this one, it would, if you show any pattern, it will pick out only the corners. Here's an example. On the left top corner, you have a, a, a square, just to make it simple. This CNN, with that input, is going to start. It, uh, I'm showing you like a moving picture, because that's what it is. It is analog. It goes in real time, but it is so fast, it works in nanosecond time range. And so this is exactly, it just go from right to left and continue. And you can see that if, starting with a solid rate, eight by eight picture, to, for simplicity and illustration for today, where we know there are only four corners, and you see that it evolves just like butter, melting and melting, until finally toward the lower end, it, what's left are only the four things it is supposed to find, the four corners. That's what a CNN does. It's simple, but it's true for any picture, not just like simple one. Like the next one, on the left top corner, is a pattern that is no longer so simple, and the CNN will pick up, a toe up after the evolution only the corners on the lower right corner. And I can prove to you that it is exact. It will always do it correctly, even if it was simple. But there are many templates. Each one would do one simple thing. So you can imagine that you can write, if you, because it's so fast, you can write a program to say, do this, and then next one, and next one. This is how the Toshiba chip does. With that, you can solve all kinds of problems. Here is an interesting problem. In a book by Minsky and Popper that was published by these two famous MIT professors. This is a famous book, or many people call it infamous. 
because uh, for those who did not know this book, essentially, uh, after it was published, essentially killed off the area of neural network research uh, because it proved that this perceptron, which is a single layer neural network, is not smart enough. It's not smart enough because this book, the whole book is just to do to prove one thing, that for these two patterns, which consist of a geometric object here, it turns out that one of them is actually made of two disconnected pieces, and the, where the other one is totally connected, one piece. But the question is, in fact, you in the audience probably will not be able to tell which one is a single piece and which one is, is made of two pieces. Malvin, Minsky, and Papa proved in the book that the perceptron cannot solve this problem. That killed off the area because all the grants disappeared for 10 years, okay? Okay, now I will show you as our CN can do it with one template. That template is on the top left corner, 19 numbers. And here is the evolution. Now think of these red patterns uh, there. As a, uh, it's best to think of a red fence, made of wood and red wood fence. So the action of this template is as soon as you turn it on and the camera see this picture on the left, it's just as if you are uh, lighting a, I'm, uh, for, for the folks on the web, I know there are uh, a lot of you out there where you cannot see this, but here is uh, the beginning point, time zero. It's not like you're lighting a match. You start to burn the wood. And what you're seeing is the evolution over time, because this, in the chip, in the Toshiba, Toshiba camera, this will take in nanoseconds the speed, and it will keep burning until the air, toward the end when nothing is moving anymore. That means, that's the, 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 and you see something still there. So that says that the first one is not one piece, okay? Because something is left. That's what the algorithm is doing. The same template now show the second one. The same, you start the file much on the left, top left corner and let it evolve. You notice that toward the end, there's nothing left. Everything is burned. It's got to be a continuous thing. So I just show you the CNN is smaller than a perceptron and just 19 numbers would do it, okay? All right, now, there are other things. Uh, in fact, uh, I, just to show you an uh, interesting uh, example, uh, here is a, a famous uh, uh, pattern. Look at the lower left corner. You see it, uh, a job, two, two objects there. And I think most of you uh, with uh, a normal eyesight would probably tell me that the top uh, horizontal bar is longer than the lower horizontal bar, okay? But in fact, if you look at the next slide, you will see that they are exactly the same length. It's an illusion. It's an illusion, but we have a CNN. This time it was a five by five, just to give you a little variation. You need a little more power for CNN. You need to the next, next neighbor. And if you would take the CNN and you show this picture on the left-hand side, what do you see? The CNN she on the right hand side, indeed they see that the upper one is longer than the lower one. The CNN is full, just like our retina. So it can show you that, that the CNN is in fact not only intelligent, it can emulate many uh, things that our brain does, okay? Okay, now, the Toshiba camera is not just the camera itself, but but it, it, it comes with, of course, a little while that, uh, this is copy from Proceba, this is not my picture. You can plug it in into a PC, and you can type in a program. There's a simple language, you know, something, uh, that, you know, very simple. And you can say, load uh, template number five, uh, and then followed by template number 17 or whatever, and then say go. Uh, this is, uh, the, for the last example, you don't need that, it's just one template. But for more complicated situation, you need several. Here's an example of something that is more complicated. Uh, by the way, a typical instruction, uh, when I say instruction, I mean one template. See, so find the corners, that's one instruction, okay? And then there, there are hundreds of instructions, templates. So you can call it a subroutine, or, or just call it an instruction. So you can write a program 
using a simple language, just say, uh, find the corners, uh, and, and you can say, do this and do that, and output, okay? Now, CN chip is so fast, one instruction can be implemented in the CN chip in less than the time for light to travel one foot. The CN is, is so, universal chip is, in fact, so fast you can detect a bullet in flight and have sufficient time to program another bullet to collide with it. And I'll show you an example. I actually have a movie, and this is just a snapshot. Here's a, this is just a snapshot of a gun just firing a bullet. You can see it stopped right there. because the CN is so fast, you can capture that. And bullet is shooting at an apple. You can see that that little bullet just left the apple, and this is captured by the CN. By, it's exactly by that Toshiba chip, an earlier version of that, uh, that, was, uh, that was designed and built in Spain. Okay? The Toshiba is just a, a more fancy version of the same program. And then, finally, it hit the, the apple and it explodes. So this is now the repeat of this full sequence. So the CNN or the Toshiba chip can already do this and more just by writing a simple program, because by virtue of fact, it is so fast. Now, I'm going to move uh, on uh, to uh, other things, because uh, uh, the other thing that you see are, perhaps, if we have time in the uh, discussion, and anybody interested, I can show you more examples. But what I want to move on for the last 20 minutes of my talk is, that, is the, the, the most important subject, in my opinion, the deeper subject, something that you would want to commit to memory, and something that you, most of you have never heard of before, it's called the principle of local activity and edge of chaos. This is really meat that you want to really get today. Now, go back to the Husky and Huxley uh, famous model, which I told you remains the best model and widely used today. Nothing, nothing wrong with that model. The only problem is that they, they had misidentified the time varying element, you know, but they are memory stores. But it doesn't hurt the model because the equations are correct, okay? But for more than 60, until today, most people still do not know uh, how is that, what's the mechanism that generates that, you know, from a constant minus 65 nanovolt, all of a sudden about 40 nanovolt, a jump of about 100 millivolt over a tiny fixed fraction of time, almost instantaneous. The biologists like to call this all or nothing because it, it's, it's just it's steady and it's always a boom, okay? This kind of phenomena, by the way, can only be explained by the phenomenon age of chaos. This is really the deep subject for today. So this is that action potential. How does this, what's the mechanism? We're gonna talk about that toward the end of this series. Now, the action potential, by the way, that I just showed you earlier is, is a, a line, a one-dimensional one, a string of CNN. Um, or you can call it a CNN because every cell is identical. So that's, in fact, is a one-dimensional CNN. And no matter how long that action is, you actually say from the head to toe, it may be a little bit longer than one meter, but imagine you have an action that is as long as from Earth to the moon. And you would hit, stimulate, the action and the action potential will, will emerge and it will go all the way to the moon. And if you look at the moon and, and pick a signal, you find it's exactly the same signal with exactly the same strength and height. There's, it doesn't diminish. How is that possible? No one can explain that. And the only sensible explanation is that it's on the edge of chaos. So that's why this is so important. Okay. Now, not many people, in fact, we just found this two weeks ago. We, this is still using the Husky and Huxley equation. Same model, but now on, instead of a single line, we are looking at a whole area. This happens within our heart, when we are heart bits, we, we, we have a whole area of, of neurons kind of thing. And this is, a, this is the same, exactly the same equation from Husky and Huxley, and even the same parameters. And notice that with the initial condition on the top left, and go downward, this is evolution in time, and soon after it evolved into this concentric, semi circular pattern. And this is snapshot. In fact, the whole thing is always moving. So you see this wave, 
And this is called a target pattern because it's just like you're shooting at a target. Okay, that's called target pattern. At least that was the, the name in, in the literature. I've just shown you that the Haskell Axe equation can produce target waves. This is just two weeks old. It's not even published yet. And with this little different initial pattern, the same parameter, Haskell Hackley equation can grip, can, again, from left down, continue on, this is a snapshot. All of a sudden, it evolves into a spiral. This is called, this is called spiral wave. This wave, this is a wave because it's continue to move. If you look on, on, a, on, on a surface, uh, just like a water, except that this is another water wave, you will see all this thing going on along. And this is new phenomena that most people did, do not understand. And it occurs, turn out, if Husky and Huxley have that, it should occur in our brain. And nobody knew what that's for, but they do know that when this is not good news if you have that. Because, for example, this is the onset of epilepsy, as one example. But people begin to realize that uh, such wave could be used in many other constructive ways. Nobody knows. But I'm just showing you that this is the same circuit that you have just seen earlier. This, by the way, is CNN, OK? The cells are all identical. Every one of them is Hodgkin's Hodgkin cell. And the resistor, instead of just one dimensional, is just a grid. Those are the influences, and they're identical. Okay? So that's an example of a CNN as well. Okay, so I've just shown you that, it, that the unknown mechanism of the abrupt Haskin Hackley action potential is, in fact, the edge of chaos. And this is the whole subject has finally been written into a book called The Local Activity Principle by Professor Meinzer, and my name was there, but I didn't write a word of this book. <laughs> Professor Meinzer uh, essentially read my papers and essentially copied both virtually and put it into a whole book, and he was, he's famous by, for those of you who did not know, Professor Meinzer is famous uh, computer scientist and mathematician and a philosopher at the University of Munich. So he's a remarkable person. Uh, and when I gave the same talk in many other occasions, most of the audience sort of find it very interesting, but they didn't really understand the detail. Professor Meinzer heard my talk and came back two weeks later and said, I want to write a book. And that is his book, just to show you how fast he can understand. And this book is the book you want to learn if you want to know about local activity principle. Okay. And you will see that all cells are either locally passive or locally active. And out of, and imagine you're, tu you're tuning a, a knob or parameter. And if, if you don't know where you're tuning, most of the time you'll be locally passive and you will get nothing, nothing interesting. When you get to local activity, some interesting will happen, but the most interesting thing, like what you've seen, the action potential and all this pattern you've seen, you had to be in the edge of chaos region, which is in fact a very tiny area, so small, that, that I need to, to actually uh, magnify them to, so I can show that. And that's good news because I have developed the mathematics and show you even though the theory is quite sophisticated, not possible for me to present to you even in several hours, you can test it with very simple matrix algebra, so something that everyone can use. And that's the concept of edge of chaos. Now, the principle of local activity, interestingly, pertains to open systems, where entropy is non-monotonic function. As you all know, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything in a closed system, uh, entropy must increase, which means that things get more and more disorder, and eventually everything becomes homogeneous. And when you have homogeneous thing, there is no information. It's nothing useful, no intelligence at all. But what you have just seen today, they're all intelligent. They're all examples. They carry information. They are only possible with local activity, with, with, with cells that are locally active. And it has to be an open system, because the second thermodynamic says 
that for a closed system, none of this could be possible. Okay? And so it is the missing complementary principle of the second law of thermodynamics. Many people, by the way, are calling, including Professor Meinzer, is calling now my, lockup, my principle of locality as the fourth law of thermodynamics because this is exactly the, what's missing for the second, the first second law, in spite of fact, it is such an important law, is totally useless for information processing. In order to complete that second law, this is what you need, the principle of local activity, okay? So edge of chaos, in fact, is a pearl embedded within the domain of local activity. I just show you a picture there. Uh, typically you have, imagine that you have a circuit that you want to make as a cell of a CNN, and you are supposed to tune the parameters so that, so that you will optimize it. And if you don't have a theory, you will be just looking for a needle in a high haystack, and most of the time, you will be groping in the dark and you will end up with nothing interesting like the local activity. And if you're lucky, you get into the local activity region where it's all red. And that's also no good in the sense that it is too violent. Nothing interesting would, because things will just explode. You had to be in the green little area. And that's the good news. That area is very small. And it's quite amazing. And that, that will be in all of my talk uh, in, in, the, in the near future. The Hodgkin Huxley equation, because of my theory, I can actually calculate it's quantitative. What I'm saying here is not qualitative. It's not philosophy. It's not something to say this is what will happen. I have the equation to back it up because I can calculate and tell you exactly what is the range of the parameter that you need to stimulate in order to have the action potential. And you will be amazed. My calculator show you within 1%. This is to show you how sharp this criterion is. That's the edge of chaos. So I have proved in a paper published about four years ago that neurons, your neurons and my neurons, are in fact all poised near the edge of chaos. We all have to be near the edge of chaos to be what we are today, to, to think and, 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 and to, to, to do all kinds of intelligent things. And in fact, our brain can make spiral waves and target waves that I just shown you. And if, in fact, this is interesting. Using my computation, my, 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 my algorithm to calculate edge of chaos region, I've shown that if the range of edge of chaos in the Hodgkin Huxley neuron were to be untuned by more than 2%, there would be no intelligent life. It is that accurate. It's, it's just, uh, it, you, you just stop by 2%, there would be nothing alive today. It is, it's still unbelievable. How, how, how close uh, that little margin is uh, for, for us to be here today. And certainly life is impossible without age of chaos. So the mechanism of age of chaos, in fact, by the way, the proof of the, I have a theorem and the algorithm to calculate age of chaos, but the theorem is very complicated to prove something that would take several hours and you have to be more or less a mathematician to understand. But today, the good news is that you can understand basically the mechanism if you understand that what my students are called the trust reader. So what is the trust reader? I'm going to tell you what the reader is. And if you want to know the answer, either you solve this reader or you come back the last lecture and we tell you the answer. Because that is the answer to Edge of Chaos. This is probably the deepest mechanism that you would want to learn. If there's one thing you want to learn in this course, that is the edge of chaos. So here's the right reader. I have a black box. And that black box is very simple. And I'll tell you how simple later on. Now, if I connect a battery there, any, any value you want, I put in an initial current, say in this case, if you look at the picture, at, at, at minus two ampere or whatever, and if you let it go, you turn the switch off, on, and you see that it would settle down to a steady state after a short period of time. And I even have the equation given. So I gave, it, gave you plenty of clue. I tell you what the solution, and everybody will see that that's a kind of a, a standard one constant circuit. 
And everybody also knows that when, when you add some dissipation, like a resistor, you're going to just make things more sluggish. You, you know, you have more friction when you're driving a car, you're going to have to slow down. Everything's going to slow down. So if you put in anything that's dissipated, like a resistor, you would expect the same answer, and you would expect it to be slower. But not so in this particular circuit. In the bottom thing, I had inserted the same circuit, a 4 ohm resistor. And with the same initial condition indicated, it shoots up, it blows up. That's amazing. The answer to this circuit is exactly the mechanism for edge of chaos. Remember, you know, and this is the same thing that happens with all extreme events including the sudden drop in a stock market. Anything that's, that's steady and it's all of a sudden, boom, is on the stage of chaos in some sense. Except that I don't have the equation to back them up. I'm not an economist, but this is the mechanism. Here, this is precise. So I'm not giving a, a, a qualitative or philosophy. This is the exact equation you can calculate. OK, so what the, the reader is what is inside that black box that has this property. And I'll give you a hint. The black box contains two linear basic circuit elements. It's amazing, just two. Two out of the three basic elements, and they're linear. Your job is to find out how to connect those, how to, well, these two elements, how to connect them, what are the values. Simple enough, anyway. If you can find the answer, come back to the, the last lecture, you will get the answer, okay? So now let's talk about uh, 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 CNN, that's one, you have seen one dimension CNN. The action is one dimensional, but let's they, they, they make it long enough and then uh, uh, connect them together into a ring. So that's the CNN, okay? And so it's one dimensional, so the, the sphere of influence is seen as three by three, it'll be just one by three. So every cell, you only need to look at your left and your right, and we're gonna make this, in fact, for today, uh, a binary zero or one to make things simple, okay? And so you have three input. Three bits, and the first three columns are the three bits. So there are only eight combinations of, of, of three bits. And so there are 200 different, this is the truth table. I'm just showing you one of them, okay? And that column on the right is what that particular CNN, so this is a kind of a template for one dimensional CNN. And if you look at the right top, this is just the same number coded uh, from the red, from the from the right color up and down, this is one zero zero one zero 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 one. That's what okay. But you can think of that. There are two hundred fifty six different ways, different two tables. So instead of giving you a picture every time, I would just tell you a number. The, and this one, for example, the, the code of that will give you one thirty seven. So I call this is one thirty seven uh, CNN. And you can have a CNN that will make. Uh, you can write a program that would get any one of these 256 code. But 137 is special. If there's one thing you will not ever forget about this lecture, if you come to my last lecture, you will never forget this number 137, okay? And you will, you will see why if you come to my third, the last lecture. Because uh, one of the reasons is, by the way, the CNN can mimic 137 as well as any, uh, other 256 new, but 137 is special for today. 137 is important because it can mimic a Turing machine. Therefore, CNN can mimic a Turing machine, and that's important enough. And by the way, HP has demonstrated in, uh, two years ago in a publication that a memristor circuit model which executes a universal Turing machine via cell automata with rule 137, so in principle, you can actually build a 137, okay? But as I say in principle, because to be a Turing machine, you would need a, 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 a very, very long uh, uh, one ring of CNN. But, but conceptually, uh, this is true, okay? So the climax of this lecture, I'm down to the last three minutes, is that I'm gonna give you uh, the last, in, in the last lecture, uh, the foundation and application of Wolfram's, uh, many of you probably have heard about Wolfram's monumental book. This is a book that's uh, about a thousand pages long. That's a famous book. And it's called A New Kind of Science. This book is full of wonderful examples, but 
It has no theory, no experience, except anecdotes, because they are examples, and, but he has no theory. And I'm going to give you the theory in the last lecture. And, I would, this, and they will be presented and illustrated via what I call metaphors from physics, quantum mechanics, and social sciences. So, so this last lecture is going to essentially cover everything that you didn't know about Wolfram's book and are afraid to ask, and you will have the answer. Okay. So, I, by the way, my I typically in my lecture at Berkeley, I always end my lecture with what I call a quotation or an end quote. I'm going to do the same thing with a 12th lecture. I'm going to end with a quotation that's relevant to that particular lecture. Now, what's relevant today about is the HP invention of the uh, <coughs> Mem Richter was, of course, great, greeted by most people as a great accomplishment. But surely, many people and many companies came out and said, well, well look at my, something I published five years ago, 10 years ago. It has a pinch history, it's just look, so therefore it's a CNN. Well, sure, they are CNN, but the difference is that HP know what they didn't know. Whereas the other groups of people didn't know what they didn't know. And so I end with my quote from Confucius, which says, to know that one knows what one knows, and to know that one doesn't know what one doesn't know, there lies true wisdom. Think about it. Thank you for coming. I notice I still have 30 seconds, so, uh, but uh, uh, I guess I'm open for those folks of you tuning in some, anywhere. I understand that there are more than a thousand of you out there, so I'm, I'm gratified that, especially those from Tokyo and Korea, I know you're waking up uh, listening to this. Thank you for tuning in. And I'm ready to entertain questions or discussions. Then, yeah, we need a, a microphone so that uh, the folks out in the web will know what the question is. So anyone asking a question, please state it clearly. Because remember, the, the folks out there, and I was told there were more than a thousand folks out there listening. So this is, uh, this is cheating a little bit because I've actually read some of your papers, so I have a, uh, a good idea of the answer to your riddle. But uh, uh, what I'd like to do is challenge uh, the people who are here in the audience anyway personally uh, that if you, can, if you can answer Leon's riddle uh, and, and send, uh, send in a, uh, 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 an answer to it well before he, he announces what it is uh, in, in lecture 13, I'll take you out and, 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 and buy lunch for anyone who's uh, personally here. And if that turns into a lot of people, well, uh, that's on me, okay? So, uh, so, so that's, that's the first thing. Uh, so I, I wanted to just uh, 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 make a quick comment, and that is uh, one of the issues that, that Leon has done with, uh, with his theory of nonlinear electronics is he, he allows you to gain insight into it. Most people essentially are just taking stuff and throwing it on spice, turning the crank on spice and accepting whatever comes out. Sometimes it's right, and spice can handle nonlinear systems. And sometimes what comes out of, out of what comes out of spice is actually just pure garbage. And figure and and in order to be able to distinguish the garbage from the good stuff, you kind of have to have this uh, this uh, uh, this intuition uh, for what uh, nonlinear uh, uh, systems uh, actually mean. So I wanted to lead into a question for Leon, and that is or at least a, you know, a, a, a plea, and that is as you are leading us through these lectures, can you uh, uh, provide uh, uh, examples of insights that you can get from uh, your, your uh, uh, systems that you're working with and how you could be led astray if you were simply plugging that into a, a computer program blind and hoping for the right answer to pop out? Uh I'm not sure I understand exactly what the, what the question is. Can you repeat that, please? So, so, the, so the issue is, as I said, most people, frankly, don't bother to read your book. 
what they do is they just take whatever equations they've got, and they plug it into SPICE and hope for the best. And, and they get an answer. And so one of the issues is how, how can you recognize when, you, when, you've, uh, 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 when you're relying, sh shall we say, on a, on a piece of CAN software, uh, that when it gives you an answer, uh, that there are criteria that you can present that, that actually you can understand that it's correct or not. If I understand you, you were asking uh, how does one recognize uh, the importance and the meaning of, of some of these uh, issues or, or theorems that I have stated uh, without putting in the time to read, uh, uh, say, the whole chapter. Is that a question? Well, well, not, not quite that. It's, yeah. it's, as I said, I mean, what most people will do is, is they just rely on, on a CAN software routine. And software, so what I, and right. And so, uh, you know, some, some program that somebody has right. written, uh, Spice is, of course, the wonderful example, but, but uh, uh, what I'm asking you uh, to, to do as you present your lectures in the future, can you, as, as you're doing it, can you come up with some examples that you might be able to present where uh, if, if, if people just take a... a a, a solution to an equation by faith, they, they would wind up getting the wrong, wrong answer. You showed some of that a little right. bit with, with, uh, with your very first uh, uh, example of the Izaki diode and how that leads to right. problems. Well, I certainly will. Uh, yeah, well, I, I certainly will. In fact, next lecture, if you come, you will see why the MIT professors or a Simon professor cannot uh, write state equations for that circuit and why they cannot even predict or can describe what's going to happen, or what that circuit is supposed to say. I mean, what, what's the steady state behavior? So things like that is going to be given, and, uh, uh, and, and many other examples that I'm, so I'm going to give you a lot of examples, and, and, uh, and we'll have more time. I, I have 12 lectures to do this. Of course, we have a lot of topic, but I will try my best uh, to give you enough examples that you will understand, uh, first of all, that it works and why it works. That's what's important. If you use a computer program, it's a black box. You would just say that it, it gives you the right answer, but you wouldn't know why, why it works. Well, my lecture is not going to do that. It's going to tell you how and what's the mechanism that it works. So at least you will, you will get that much. Is that uh, OK? Yes. Right. Uh, and any other questions and, and from, 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 from the web? I'll answer the web. Uh, can also send in their questions. Hi. Um, oh, where's hello, the Hello, I'm over here. Okay, <laughs> hi. Christine. Hi, thank you for this. has been really insightful. Um, a quick question for you. Is there any way you could describe the moment you um, discovered the new circuit element memorister? Yeah, can you say that again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you describe the moment you discovered the new element memorister? And oh, how? the moment? Yeah. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Okay. Well, in, in fact, uh, it's... It's not one moment, uh, you know, un unlike some of those uh, other ingenious discoveries, this is actually uh, sort of just follow through. I'm, the, the, the one of the things I will show you next Tuesday, next week, is that, uh, to, to, that there was no foundation at all for nonlinear circuits. They were, they were, they were just all, all uh, uh, ad hoc in, until then. This is why I have to develop a foundation. And when that foundation is being is developed, you will finally see, it's just like Mendeleev's uh, chemical table. He also was sort of frustrated with the fact that, 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 that uh, the, one should not just look for element. There must be a, a system where you can see the, how this element ought to be placed and where they are located. And, then, and from that, he found there were holes, missing holes. And if his theory is correct, those holes got to be there. And, and so, of course, we all know they're all there now. We all found, found all of them. Well, it's, this, it's the same situation that uh, next week you see that the, the, the approach I take is called axiomatic approach. And you would be amazed that, that axiomatic approach is nothing that, that, that you thought you, what it is. And an and, and axiomatic approach is something that I say is timeless, unlike, unlike the, the three classical definition. It's obsolete after something gets invented. Well, what you are going to learn next week, the foundation is timeless, 
in the sense that it will never be absolute. It's just like the law of nature, and like, like Newton's law. Okay, of course, even Newton's law gets superseded by Einstein, but within this range where it's applicable, it will it will be uh, remain correct, and and that's what uh, how this memristor is, uh, and you, you in fact uh, I had sort of sort of uh, skipped over quite a few few slides since I have a few minutes. You maybe I can I can ask for some of this, and and request that this be shown, and and you appreciate more. Uh, I, I have sort of a, a cheat sheet here, so I can so uh, uh, pull out uh, some some of the things that I, I actually was planning to show you. Uh, Well, actually, uh, the one that I had in mind is actually not here. So, so uh, let me skip, skip that. But uh, the, you, you are going to understand what I mean by an axiomatic approach next week. And you will see that the memory store, you know, is not something that, that, I, that, 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 that you need a genius to, to involve. It, it will just pop out just because something is missing. That, that's what it is, OK? And uh, are there any other questions? Yes, please. Um, I noticed on your um, 2D simulations of uh, CNNs, you got a spiral network. And I, you're probably very much aware of this, but heart attacks are known to sometimes proceed by these spiral waves that they um, just saw. I, I just read about it not too long ago. and. The heart does have a two-dimensional neuron network, and they were confused about where it was coming from, and they finally saw these spiral things. Have you made connection to yes. the theory of heart attacks? Well, thank you for uh, mentioning this question, because that's exactly, in fact, what I was going to plan in the future. It turns out that Huskins Huckley equation is not only for our brain. It, it turns out that just by very minor modification, it's not exactly the same equation, but almost the same, and, and we change different parameters. It applies to our heart. And, and the, the reason that our heart beat is because it's a CNN. It's full of these this, this cells that, that oscillate. And, and, they, and, and under the normal situation, the oscillation all synchronized together so that you can pump, pump blood. Now, unfortunately, for certain people, those that had disease, like uh, uh, those with ventricular fibrillation, uh, under certain condition that is not yet known to the medical profession, uh, the heart bit start to uh, a bit irregularly, and 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 shortly after that, if you don't uh, sort of rush in, but uh, with with a special instrument that typically uh, you would find in the airline, would will up in the cabin with two electrodes, and they will stick you into your chest and pump five thousand volts into you, and you will jerk up, and you 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 back to normal. That sort of thing is quite standard now, and it's well understood in some sense. Well, that's a CNN when ovary. And when just before that thing happens, it has been observed in real machine, not in a real human heart, because no human, we would not put out a new human, but we'd want a rabbit. You can actually cut up a rabbit and put it in a situation that you can induce that ventricular fibrillation. And just before that happened, you will see these spiral waves squirming, and at that squirming, the heart begins to squeak, squeak you know, uh, uh, contract, and, and soon enough, the rabbit dies. And this is the, a great example of, of, of spiral waves. And unfortunately, it appears that you and I eventually are going to go through that stage just before our heart uh, uh, drops, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to to live all in. Still, you're going to go through the stage. And when that happens, just prior to happen, you are going to have spiral waves. So it's not, a, it's not something nice to have, OK? But it has other situations where it is nice to have. Uh, many people begin now to, 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 to uh, conjecture that this is important for uh, learning. And, and because that's a way of communicating. When, when you learn, you need many neurons 
all over, not just along a single line, communicating. And how do you send signal uh, from, uh, you know, from, from neuron X to neuron YZ, whatever, and, and so to ask them to do certain things? Well, you need to have signals. The signal, one obvious signal, is a target wave. A target wave, remember, is just, 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 just like if you, if you drop a water on a pond, you get up those words. Those are, those are water waves. But water waves are totally different from the target wave of CNN that, that works by local activity. And one of the things that, or sound waves, or electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves. You see, this standard wave that most of you are aware of, uh, imagine electromagnetic waves or sound waves. When two waves collided, electromagnetic wave, what happens is you have reflection and you have interference pattern. Everybody knows that in high school physics, right? Well, not so with spiral waves or target waves. This kind of wave, when they intersect, collided, what happened? They just annihilate each other. And, and it just keep going, you know. And in fact, I have video that would, that would uh, do, do all that things. And uh, perhaps since, since you asked the question, uh, and we still have a little bit of time, uh, may I request... Uh, the, uh, I have a short video that I would like to, to request that that be shown. Uh, let me f figure out where, where, where that is. Can you, okay, can you, can you switch on to the video? I have this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the uh, cheat sheet here, but, okay, okay, there you are. This is, this is the video of uh, a wave appearing in, in real time. This is, this is, see what happened there? This is a spiral we're going, okay? By the way, there is sound, is there, can, can you put on the sound? It's just the background music, nothing to do with, <laughs> with the physics, just so that it won't be so boring. There, there's, there's more, there, there are three parts in that. Can you switch on? Well, the, we just saw this spiral away. We want to see another one. Now, this is the mechanism of another wave. No, that's, this is still the spiral. We, we're in the wrong, but let's finish this. Now notice that when it hits the boundary, nothing is reflected. Just watch. Watch. Nothing is reflected. This would not happen with electromagnetic wave. You just keep, keep going on. So it's a, it's a wave, okay? This is more like a hurricane, by the way. And there's now a uh, general feeling that even the galaxy, you know, why is this galaxy all spiral? Turns out that if you look at all the other neighboring stars, they are essentially operate with the dynamics that induces a spiral wave. Can I? Can you switch to the first one? The first, the, there were three parts. It's like this uh, video, right? Well, this is actually this is one dimensional. This is show you. This is now one dimensional action. Imagine you're going all the way to the moon, and that action potential will not diminish by one bit, even to the end of the moon, it will still be there. It is a totally different mechanism, nothing that you ever thought of. And the next one, please. Now, this is the target wave. This is more like dropping a water on a pond, but it's totally different. See that? Now you have one is a full circle now, or an ellipse. And now you, a second one would, would emerge, and then the third one, and then when it hit the boundary, it's not going to, there will be no reflection. It just, it just go on. It's a wave, it goes on forever. This, the interesting thing about this video is that this is almost brand new. We're talking about just one week old, and this is from the Huxley and Huxley equation. So it's not, it's not something out of a figment of my imagination. This is what your brain and my brain ought to have under certain conditions. 
And, and because the parameter we use is exactly the same parameter that Hodgkin has to use to get his Nobel Prize. It's the same parameter, it's just a different initial condition, different you know, initial point. So, so it's just a, it means that you, uh, certain diseases might trigger epilepsy or migraine headache. This can all be explained someday, I believe, through this mechanism. Next question, please. Thank you, Leon. Um, I had a question about the evolution of intelligence. So in the first part, you kind of talked about how all brains are composed of emristors, and so you gave the example of the Hodgkin-Huxley, and you've got the, you know, the ion channels and so on. And so then you talked about how that's not enough, that you've got this concept of edge of chaos, which is this tiny, tiny region in kind of the phase space. And, it's, and, it, you know, and so it's not enough to have these memristors in your circuit, you actually have to tune them exactly into this region. So I was just kind of curious about any thoughts you have on you know, how easily you can actually lock into such, something like that, you know, both in the context of evolution or if you've come across kind of any examples of circuits that naturally kind of lock into, you know, through maybe some feedback mechanism, lock into such a tiny region of phase space. Okay, well, it turns out that in order to apply my algorithm, you have to give me the equation, okay? You have to give me the problem. If you give me the equation of your circuit or yourself, then it's straightforward. Uh, and, and, and in fact, it's a standard procedure. You first look for what's called the operating point. Uh, when, when, it's not, when the phenomena is not yet triggered, it'll be just, just sitting there, you know, and not, as if nothing is happening. Mathematicians like today not like to call, call it dead. It's a dead cell. But there's a difference between the real true dead cell and those that, that are ready to jump up if they are locally active. And my theory will tell you whether your parameters is in the dead cell area or in the active area, in the locally active area. And, and if it's in the locally active area, just by virtue of the fact that you have the question, you can, it will actually point you away, tell you how do you massage your parameters so that you will get not only in the local area, but get into the less violent part, which means the edge of chaos region, which is typically a very small, and that's the good news, okay? And, and the good news also is that, that normally you don't get that actually from mathematics. It, this is just pure luck, that, that in the edge of chaos case, uh, the, the region that my equation would tell you uh, how to work with will actually be satisfied, uh, well, either not satisfied. There are situations where, where you, you could have only local activity, but there's no reach, it's a chaos region. And typically, that would not be very useful. It would it's just seem to explode, okay? And the interesting thing is that there is, in fact, between the totally dead cell and those that are potentially alive. And th th that tiny little region is the edge of chaos where all computation, all intelligence will occur. M the name edge of chaos has been used by many people in the last 20 years, not in the same context, but intuition. Everybody, most people in this area thought that there ought to be uh, uh, some region or whatever region, because they have no equation, this just quality, that they thought that there would be some region where things can happen. And, and a good example is this Cumbrian expression, explosion, as I just told you, you know, pr about 542 million years ago. Uh, prior to that, there were only one cell mechanism. This is all from fossil, from fossil record. We know that before then, uh, they, were, they, they, they were living things, but they were only one cell, simple making like bacteria or viruses or bacteria. In their, their record, fossil record. And then all of a sudden, with a very short span of a few million years, out of 540, one or two million years, is nothing, right? And, and that, that's why it's from, from zero to suddenly a, a proliferation of species. All the animal species, the events of you and me, all stuff came up from that little burst of activity. 
that is a perfect example of edge of chaos qualitatively is from nothing to something. And, and as I say, this is the same kind of phenomena I call extreme events, even earthquake, you know, something you, you cannot expect it, a sudden boom. And it's, it's not something you can predict it's that because something you can predict no matter should be gradual. Okay, that's what we all learn in school, gradual. But this is not, this is a totally different kind of thing. The generation action potential is from zero to something big, and then stay big there, okay? So, so, so the good news about the age of care is that uh, for the first time we have not only a theory, we have a constructive theory. You see, in mathematics there's such thing called existence. We simply, it's correct, we simply say that, that this is possible. But it didn't tell you how to find it. And there's a kind of mathematics that's called constructive, which means that not only it proves that this is possible, but it tells you how to find it. The edge of chaos theory that I developed is constructive. Okay? So it's not philosophy. And again, for those of you folks listening in the way, anywhere in, in, this, uh, out, uh, in the world, uh, m many of you probably have heard about edge of chaos before and especially out of the Santa Fe group. And I'll tell you that I'm using the same name deliberately for the totally different, they are not this, my age of chaos is different from all the other age of chaos that's been ever mentioned because those were philosophies, they were, those were examples. They were not, there was no basis. I'm using the same name so I don't, because I don't want to waste such a beautiful phrase which captures exactly the essence to something that is qualitative that are in fact not correct. So edge of chaos, as I define here, is original. It's my definition, but it is a constructive theory. It is based on mathematics. It's 100% correct it's because I have proved it mathematically, and, it's, and you can carry it out. Good news is you carry it out with simple mathematics, like linear algebra. Does that answer your question? Any other question? One, one last question from, from the web. Um, you talked about the edge of chaos um, and the Cambrian explosion, but do you think the edge of chaos is related to the emergence of life at all? Can, can, can you repeat that a little louder, please? Do you think the edge of chaos is related to the emergence of life in its biological form? Oh, the question is, do I think the edge of chaos is related to biological form to the, uh, uh, to, to the beginning of life, right? The, the birth of life. Well, uh, it would be too, too, too ambitious for me to make that kind of answer because remember when I claim that I have a complete theory, it is only complete to the extent that you can give me an equation, mathematical equation, and in fact not only all equations but equations called the reaction diffusion equations that I will define later on, but basically a reaction diffusion equation, even though most of you didn't know what it is, is nothing but just the grid of resistor with those uh, uh, Husky and Huxley cells pin at the node. If you write the equation of that particular example and make the, the grid closer and closer together and in the limit, you will get a system equation that mathematicians call reaction diffusion equation. It's therefore a very broad class of equation that, that in fact, uh, the only class of equation that is, that is understood well by mathematicians. My theory is for that class of equations. It's proof for that theory. Anything else is an extrapolation. And, but I will tell you that, that the mechanism of the birth of life from nothing to something, uh, anything, or even the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, what do we have? Well, nobody knows what we have, but we know it's nothing, or at least uh, not, nobody knows what. And then, boom, there's something that from almost nothing to something gigantic. And, and happen almost instantaneously. These are extreme events. The edge of chaos has elements of this kind of phenomena, and I, and, and I will be the first one to tell you that, that, that I don't claim that my theory will apply to that, but I'm telling you that I have a theory that if you extrapolate the mechanism, it will seem to be reasonable to expect that something like that should happen but with a, in a much more complicated way because anyone who would come up with the equation of the Big Bang would be very complicated and it would take years to develop a theory that would correctly describe the situation. But for those 
examples, those extreme events that do not have equations, including the drop, the bubbles and the stock market, there are no equations. And so it can only put, uh, explain qualitatively, but you have now a foundation. The edge of chaos, we say that for a broad class of system, including the brain, we understand how this can happen. Okay. Any other question? No. Uh, I got one minute. Well, can I sort of finish that off by asking you because there was uh, something that we should we should end. Can can you uh, go to? Uh, 132, can I switch on 132, please, and continue on all the way to 137. It's very short. Just in many talks, I, I'm afraid nobody asked this question. A lot of people have asked, why did it take so long uh, for my theory to be validated? And one quick answer is, I, you know, Max Planck had been asked these questions. And his answer is new scientific ideas do not succeed by converting contemporary scientists but rather by their opponents dying off, you have to outlive them, in other words, okay? But there's a more uh, interesting answer comes from another uh, scientist, Haldane, uh, who uh, many people th thought deserved a Nobel Prize. Most of you never heard of him because he's a, a biologist, okay? But Haldane uh, was asked the same question many years ago, and he said, when new theories have four stages of acceptance, the first stage is that uh, this is worthless nonsense. Then a few years later, come a group of people who begin to say, well, this is interesting, but perverse. A few years later, came another, more people who say, well, actually, this is true, but quite unimportant. And then the fourth stage, I always say so. <laughs> Thank you very much.